Good Hi, morning. everybody. Welcome. <laughs> um, we are starting about right on time, but why don't we give it just a little bit longer for folks to go ahead and get things up and rolling. Jess and I were sitting here talking about weather and here on the East Coast, um, it is ice rain and the roads are icy and it is a winter, what's the opposite of wonderland? Scary land. <laughs> winter, winter blah land. <laughs> yeah, winter go back to bed land. <laughs> All right, oh, well, I think we could probably get off. There's, there's a message here on the in the questions that says there's no sound. Hmm. No. That's not good. Can others chime in and let us know if that's also true for you? Uh, now there is. Okay, good. We're good. Oh, okay, good. Thank goodness yeah. that would have been difficult. Yeah, one person says the audio is distorted, but the others say that they hear us fine. So, sorry hmm. about that, Sam. Um, hopefully, that resolves as we as we get started. I hear you fine, Shasta. And we're yeah, in I different places. You. Okay. Well, yeah. Go ahead and kick us off whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, um, thank you for letting us know about the sound, Tricia. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome to the final webinar in our series. Um, at the end today, we will be sending you out an email with a link to a survey about how we've done and uh, what comments and, and questions and suggestions you guys will all have for us. Uh, so I will send that out as soon as we finish up. Um, but with that, I'm just gonna let Angie take us away. Yeah, hi again, everybody. Sort of a bitter, bittersweet day. We've made it 10 webinar sessions together. Um, we've had three guest speakers. We've gone through the whole gamut, uh, at least a, a good high level summary of, of what you need to know in terms of climate change and health and its impacts, how to do a vulnerability assessment. We've just last time finished adaptation planning and I hope it's been really valuable today. Today we close things off by talking about implementation, evaluation, and how to update those adaptation plans. So that may seem like a lot to take on right now if you haven't even begun, um, but I'm, I think it's important to keep this stage in mind. This is the holy grail. This is where you're hoping to get, is this place where you're actually in action, doing the work on the ground and getting things done and prepared and safeguarded for your community. So it's helpful to, know, to think ahead to this stage um, because it actually can inform how you plan. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and, and uh, dive in to the topic of the day. Um, and like we always do, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our suggested reading first, but it's uh, applicable, it's relevant to this topic, and it's actually relevant to the topic we talked about last time. So you all remember we had Dr. Douglas Walker with us last time, and um, we got some good feedback from you all on that topic. And so we wanted to share with you how Paula um, as a tribe is translating the psychosocial um, ideas that Dr. Walker presented into its own climate resilience framework. So basically what that means is we developed a publication summarizing what we have learned. Um, it's a literature review and it also provides information about 14 different adaptation strategies that are in Paula's adaptation plan um, that we consider to be consistent with psychosocial resilience and are gonna help Paula's, Paula as a community become more psychosocially resilient. And so we talked a little bit about last time, um, the buckets that those seem to fall in. And while I talk through that just a little bit, um, I'm interested for folks that uh, might have taken a look at this or even thought more about Dr. Walker's presentation last time. Um, if you have any thoughts, any comments, and if any strategies maybe stood out to you as being like, whoa, I wouldn't have thought to do that as part of my climate adaptation work. Um, and so 
in our plan, we actually talk about, um, like I said, 14, we consider 14 of our strategies in the climate adaptation plan to be psychosocial resilience. And we've, uh, we're getting a good start on a lot of them. And so having taken that plan and turning now towards implementation in the last six months, I guess, or so, right, Shasta? We've actually made some good progress on a lot of the strategies. And so um, under, say, provide health and, and edu health education and psychoeducation, um, we are already conducting education to help residents um, recognize illness symptoms, avoid risks, build skills um, to psycho psychologically cope and recover from climate exposure. So we have funds, like we said, to bring Dr. Walker in and do some education and training. Um, we're also in educating the community to encourage members to prepare for certain exposures and um, developing trainings for sort of internal folks, staff people at Paula um, and other sort of key stakeholders that might be able to serve as, um, as trainers or folks that can help relay this information to community members. Um, things like that. So, you know, another way to look at it was to build connection. Another opportunity for Paula um, to build psychosocial resilience was to build connection. And one way they're doing that is with their ongoing Planet Paula committee that is made up of tribal members um, that are interested in all sorts of things related to the environment, but a lot of it is climate change related. And this is where we end up doing the community engagement around um, climate adaptation. And so that is a way for these community members to actually get to know each other a bit more, build connection as they work on something together. Um, and so we consider that to be one way to build connection and come together to solve problems. So those are just some of the examples of the things that might fit uh, within this psychosocial framework. Um, another one maybe to uh, talk about is developing an emergency disaster response and health management plan. We have funds to do that, so we're working on that this year already. We developed a collaborative referral system, which was really just basic, where are the systems that exist right now, the services like mental health services, crisis counseling, medical services, where are those, and how can we make sure folks know how to get there? Um, so anyways, did any comments come through, Shasta? Not yet but at any time if anybody wants to let us know what they thought about the psychosocial resilience discussion last week or anything that they read or even any any questions or suggestions that you may have from your own experience on how you've dealt with some of these issues and i'd even be interested in hearing how you as practitioners are dealing with your own uh, emotional stresses and and maybe some of your own mental health issues. I know that uh, this work can be hard for all of us and we need to be there for one another as well as for the communities we work with. So at any time, feel free to put a comment or a question into the question box and I'll read those out as they come up. Okay, so kind of want to make a transition from last time. We had um, our guest speaker, uh, was awesome and then we sort of rushed through some of the final steps of adaptation planning but I want to touch back on this piece really quick because doing this well sets us up well for implementation and so I wanted to revisit so step four was about organizing selected strategies into an action plan and so the reason why we do this is because we're looking ahead to this next phase the implementation phase because we don't want to get stuck with just a plan that is not actionable and folks don't know what to do with it. And so doing the work here at this stage and getting that adopted means that it's clear to everybody what responsible departments are gonna have ownership for, what time frames thing, uh, certain strategies are expected to be completed, um, the status of certain strategies, what partners and resources might be utilized, and where there might be opportunities to go get more funding or where there's maybe not enough funding. And so um, I wanted to give you an example of how the Tribal Climate Health Project's Easy Tool kind of can help with this. And I think I showed it to you briefly, but I wanna show you um, also how it looks in Paul, Paula's adaptation plan, how we, how we place the adaptation action plan in the plan. Just so you can see, it's a summary. It's a summary table um, that I'll show you. So quickly, I will first bring up just the easy tool again, just to remind you. So this action plan then is sort of designed, it's part of the um, 
third tab, the evaluate strategies tab. So for each strategy, you have an opportunity to do some planning about each strategy and how you'll implement it. And so it's thinking ahead to the implementation phase. Um, and so you have a chance to plug all of this in, and then you have a chance to sort of compare how many strategies each department is going to have, weigh them, is it too much, is, are we front loading too much, are we back loading too much. This is also um, an action plan that you can use in the implementation phase too to track your progress, to keep people on track. It turns into your roadmap um, for the future, and then you can sort of adapt it as you implement to keep track of things. Um, let me show you how it looks in Paula's adaptation plan. And, uh, there we go. So this is um, a big section. It's towards the end where we narratively talk through all of Paula's adaptation strategies. And here's just a summary table of all the actions that Paula decided to take in an action plan that's fairly easy to just quickly look at. And it's organized sort of in order of status. So the types of strategies that are already in progress versus ongoing versus going to be new. Um, and then who's responsible for them. And then it gives you an indication of, um, of time frame. And so uh, that's one way to do it. And then it becomes you know, really clear for folks in the implementation phase um, what the expectations are. Because at some point, then you want to you'll be reporting back on how you're doing. OK. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention about what you can do with your adaptation plan is that we created a section, and I've seen this in a lot of adaptation plans, for outlining the rules for the next phase. So how um, rules for governing how the plan is going to be evaluated and updated. And so we have a whole section that talks about what metrics will we continue to track, um, who will complete the progress reports, who will oversee implementation, when are we going to update the plan? And so you're sort of charging yourself with some stuff within the plan, and hopefully that gets adopted, and that just becomes a part of how you operate. So there's no guesswork, and there's no confusion about what's next. OK. So now transitioning over through to this last phase, the, the cycle phase, at least what, I, what we sort of think of as a cycle. Because the process, obviously, after the adaptation plan is done and even adopted, doesn't end there. It just is beginning, right? This was where we were trying to get the whole time. Um, the BRACE framework, the CDC BRACE framework, that talks about climate adaptation, climate and health adaptation, basically says preparing for climate change is a cyclical and continuous process. So if you've ever been part of a continuous improvement process or like a performance management process or strategic planning process, you know that there are ways to uh, evaluate and touch back on, on this planning process. The plan's never the end. Um, but the good news is that you've probably already gotten started on some of the things that you have in here. And you're in good position now to pursue funds for your strategies because you know what your community needs. And, um, and there are some funds out there uh, to go and, um, and implement some of the work that you need to do. And so we're going to talk just a little bit about the steps here, basically after adoption, implementation, evaluation, and update, and talk a little bit about some companion tools that the Tribal Climate Health Project can provide as you go through this process. OK. Oh, I do have a group discussion question here. And this, you know, we don't have as much material this time to go over. So there's time. If folks want to raise their hand and actually share some experiences, that would be really wonderful. I'd love to do more uh, hearing your voices. But if you'd prefer just the question box, that would be fine, too. Um, I'm hoping for those um, who have gone through any of this process, actually, yet, if you have some words of wisdom to share here um, in terms of uh, implementing your adaptation plan. So if you've gotten to the point where you have one already, Tell us a little bit about lessons learned from impl uh, transitioning to implementation. Or if you're just in, say, vulnerability or adaptation planning right now, tell us what your thoughts are about how you're preparing yourself for implementation. And while we wait for a few responses, and again, don't be shy. This is your last opportunity to uh, have your voice heard for this series. Uh, so raise your hand or throw a question into the question box. Uh, for for us and Paula, writing the plan is is one thing, and that can be 
definitely uh, stressful and uh, anxiety provoking. But now we have one, and so we do need to phase into the implementation portion, and that is challenging for a variety of reasons. Uh, a big reason is that even though there might be funding for writing the plan, there's not often funding to be found for implementation. So we've become creative in the way we're getting some funding. So we've looked for things like FEMA grants, and we're using a FEMA grant that we received to start implementing some of our adaptation plan strategies, things like uh, an emergency alert system for the community. That was something that came up with a lot of folks was how do we know when something's going on? How do we know when air quality is poor? How do we know what the uh, situation is with a, you know, a wildfire nearby, things like that. So being able to go into some other areas without strictly saying this is for climate change adaptation, we can still implement some aspects of the plan using alternative sources of funding. And uh, for those of you who are working on your GAP applications that are due on January 16th, that's something you can put into GAP. I know we can't do implementation in GAP, but you can start doing some planning for implementation if you can put that in creative ways in your GAP work plan. Right, because at this stage, you will not have done like a full-blown feasibility plan or study for any of the adaptation strategies. So that's one way to go, right? Yeah, and again, you have to be careful about the way that you word those things when you're doing your your gap because unless it's solid waste related you can't do implementation but you can at least start looking at the feasibility of say again an emergency alert system for the community uh, in my current gap work plan i have uh, money for doing a potential app uh, a phone app so that way we can use that to try to get people the information that they need about certain weather or climate related incidents and use that as an alert system for the community. So we're exploring the feasibility of that as part of GAP. And Shasta, didn't you guys also, there was an interesting funding opportunity that came just for California because we're having all this, these power outages and de-energization. It came from the Office of Emergency Management, a little bit of money that um, tribes and other communities had access to. And so, you know, it could come from all sorts of sources. And I think uh, you are interested in trying to find some equipment to help you notify the community about um, disasters and things, right? Right, right. It was uh, for these these public safety power shutoffs that happened during high wildfire danger and the public utilities shut off power so that they don't have fires sparked by uh, downed power lines. So we asked for some funding to help develop some community outreach and emergency preparedness kits so that people have the basics that they need to deal with uh, a, an emergency power shutoff. And actually, I haven't heard from them yet, so thanks for the reminder. I should mm -hmm. contact somebody and be like, hey, give yeah. us some money. <laughs> <laughs> but so it looks like you guys are all being shy. Uh, we have no no volunteers. So yeah, again, that, that question <laughs> box is always there if you want to add some, some comments or some feedback. It could be that folks feel like they're still at the beginning of the process and um, not don't have words to, of wisdom to share yet, but um, help, you know, stay with us. We're gonna talk a little bit more about how we can sort of stay in contact in the future. Okay. All right, so let's just walk through some of these steps. So after adoption, which that could be a whole chapter for you on its own, by the way, once you do your adaptation plan, you take that to council, some folks have to go through several iterations, remove things, edit things. Let's say it's adopted and everybody's pretty happy with it. You have a roadmap for the future. Um, so that's what we're talking about, using that action plan. You'll be happy at that point you have an action plan that's clear about the steps to take and when and who. Um, but one comment here is that you may have put the smartest thoughts into that action plan and yet the best laid plans might need adjusting along the way. And you know, we are finding that. I found that with lots of different communities I've worked with. Sometimes you um, have a strategy in there and then you didn't realize that there was some fatal flaw that makes it infeasible. Or sometimes a funding source comes available and suddenly you're pushing up something that you had a little bit further back. Or sometimes you assume something would be easier than it is and it just needs to be pushed back a little. So all sorts of things can happen along the way. The nice thing about the action plan is that it is adaptable 
And so it, you should think of it as being dynamic and um, having it in some sort of a worksheet where you can continue to edit and change as you go just makes it so that it's not a torture device. It's a, a realistic way to move forward. And so um, the idea is that, you know, your lead staff, whoever that ends up being this next in the implementation phase, which hopefully you've outlined even in your adaptation plan, um, is continuing to engage stakeholders. This is not the end of the, um, the stakeholder engagement process necessarily. So um, often if you can continue to engage stakeholders, then you've got some buy additional buy-in, some motivation and some uh, morale behind actually doing some of the work, um, especially for folks that have ongoing responsibilities. So it may, the, the planning committee or planning team may sort of change in flavor a little bit. Now it's gone less um, to a sort of brainstorming and idea generation and fact finding mission to a, okay, let's, um, let's coordinate and manage the process of implementation together. So the, um, the activities of those folks that might participate, so it might be your facilities people, your, um, you know, the folks that run some of your major facilities, your folks that run your utilities, the folks that run your roads, um, you know, tribal uh, business managers, all sorts of folks can be involved. Um, now they have a little more responsibility if they were assigned specific strategies. Um, and so there's a little bit of an art to transitioning there. Somebody will oversee that process and kind of coach people along to implementation, um, hopefully without uh, rubbing folks the wrong way. Hopefully at this stage, you've already gotten the buy-in you needed and those folks are prepared um, to do the work rather than surprised by it. I've been part of a process where I got handed implementation of a climate plan and folks before the implementation phase didn't feel like they were adequately um, informed or engaged or part of the decision-making process and then kind of got miffed um, at the stage at which they were now required to do a bunch of work. Um, so that's sort of something to keep in mind if you're still in the planning phase, how important it can be to get people into the process early. Okay, um, I do wanna share with you um, just one way that Paula has begun implementation. It's a it's a pretty small thing, but it was the first thing we did because it was maybe one of the easiest things we did and we had a little funding to do it. And it was just um, some fact sheets. So like we said, one of the things we wanted to do is inform the community about high risk climate exposures and their health impacts and help them recognize them and prepare. And so Paula has put together uh, several different fact sheets that are just uh, one page, two-sided on their major exposures, extreme heat, wildfire, flooding, and storms and droughts. And so those are here again on the Tribal Climate Health website for you, uh, just to look at as an example. Other tribes have fact sheets too that I've seen that are really good and maybe organized different ways. Here's an example of one of Paula's. This is on extreme heat, and it just talks a little really high level about the exposure and the kind of climate threats, and then also about the health impacts, and then shares a little bit about some examples of what Paula is doing to prepare. So a couple of the actions in the adaptation plan and then some tips, because at this point we're speaking directly to community members, what it is they can do. And so implementation can be as easy as, you know, putting together fact sheets, getting a graphic designer and printing and publishing them and distributing them at workshops, or it could be as difficult as repairing culverts in an entire drainage system because there's dramatic flooding happening to a critical facility. So it can run the gamut, but there's ways to kind of get some easy wins under your belt early. Oh, well, that didn't come out nicely. Oh. Um, <laughs> let me really quickly, I definitely need to do a delete one thing. All right, sorry about that. Okay. So, I mean, we could go on and on a lot about implementation, but um, you may have given yourself direction for up to say 20 years for implementation of certain things. Um, and so it's a long road, it's a continuous road, but along the way, we um, recommend that you stop to evaluate how things are going. 
So if you've ever been part, like I said, of a performance management process, um, there are um, ways you, you stop to evaluate. Partially the goal of that is to make sure you have not fallen behind. Um, if you have tried some things and they're not working, you might need to adjust. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons not to just wait five, 10 years um, before you look at things because you wanna make sure you can adjust. Um, okay, so in this way, uh, in this step, lead staff coordinate regular monitoring and reporting of indicators and progress amongst responsible departments. And so again, this, um, in my experience, this has been one of the reasons that uh, one of the um, tasks of say a planning team that continues along with responsible departments is not just to do the work, but then also to um, assist in the process of reporting back on how things are going. Sometimes that could be, you know, maybe just annually you're getting sort of like a narrative back from folks about what's um, how strategies are going, how things are going. In other cases, I've seen it done where there's sort of a quarterly reporting of specific metrics and things. And so um, the easy tool kind of keeps this in mind as well and gives you a couple of opportunities to use the tool to be tracking progress. And I just wanted to point those out to you really quickly. Okay, so under the impacts tab, and we're familiar with all those possible impacts is, that's organized by exposure. So for example, if we're talking about heat, uh, we know that there's heat related stress and here's a bunch of heat related indicators that we had used for the vulnerability assessment. And the idea is you can actually continue to use some of the indicators from your vulnerability assessment on a regular basis to evaluate how things are going. And so, um, some folks may do this less frequently. You could do this on an annual basis and see if there's major changes to how climate change is impacting your community. Um, and so, for example, you could look back at uh, emergency department visits due to heat on an annual basis or something like that. You'd be comparing your baseline to whatever the current baseline is. So whatever your last measurement was, you could look at um, the most current measurement and you can calculate the difference and see if the trends are moving in a positive direction or not. Um, ideally, you're gonna want um, any of these impacts to show positive improvement, right? Because if they are something you consider a higher medium risk, hopefully you've associated with those with adaptation strategies. And this is one way to gauge whether or not your adaptation strategies are being effective is if you have um, better outcomes, right? Better, better um, or fewer impacts. That's one way to look at it. Um, another way to look at progress would be to look back at your actual strategies and just see how much progress you've made. And so this is more of an, like an output uh, metric. And one way to do that is just simply at the very end here, you could sort of mark estimate a percent complete on any given project. So say, for example, um, you're supposed to be installing backup power generators to protect your critical facilities. Um, maybe you've outlined exactly what those are and maybe you've done 50% of it in the first year. Um, and so you could just mark that. It doesn't have to be super precise, but that gives folks an indication of how, how far along you are to your completion deadline. Um, and I wanted to give you another example Another example of how a tribe is um, measuring its progress along the way. And so here's one, the Nez Pierce tribe. Um, they have a Clearwater River sub-basin climate change adaptation plan, and it identifies a number of metrics. And so um, in this case, they are basically looking at ways to measure progress on their completion of their adaptation plan um, strategies. So for example, they look at things like number of attendees at each meeting, um, documentation of changes to existing ordinances. So basically they, they task themselves with making changes to existing ordinances and then they are document, they're um, going to sort of quantify the documentation of that. Um, or for example, um, completion of floodplain modeling scenarios. So 
Sometimes these could be represented by a number, a percentage, a sort of pass fail, did it get done or not? Um, so there's all different ways to be evaluating your progress. Um, so those are just a few examples. Oops, let me go back here. And um, I do wanna go back and just talk a little bit about updating the plan. So evaluating is one thing you can evaluate that internally and have some sort of an internal process where you're tracking your progress. Um, oftentimes, um, the communities I've worked in personally will want to see a report. And so there are examples of progress reports. Um, and I share a couple of them in the resources slide um, at the very end of this presentation that you'll get. And um, you've probably done a progress report before for something else. And it's very similar. It's a very similar kind of structure. You're just reporting on how, how things are going. Um, that could be in a written report, that could be in a presentation, different, different options depending on who your, what your leadership expects to see. Um, and then updating the plan. So updating the plan is needed and you're basically trying to account for change. And so change can mean that climate change projections have changed maybe in the five years since you first did this plan. Um, and so you might need to adjust your projections. Um, Maybe the impacts are hitting harder than you expected them to. So when you go in, you might need to reprioritize what impacts and vulnerabilities you really want to focus on. Um, and then you will have made progress on your adaptation strategies um, since then. So you may take this opportunity to reconfigure your, ad your adaptation plan and what strategies are going to happen when. So you can update who's responsible. Maybe that switched to another department. Maybe you got some other new funds. Maybe you got um, maybe you have a new timeline for something, maybe some brand new need that you weren't predicting um, became very obvious and you're going to document it here. Um, one thing to say here, the reason why we have the framework the way we do, where you have a vulnerability assessment, adaptation plan, and then the cycle, you know, the continuous cycle, uh, implementation, evaluation, update, it's because we're suggesting that you don't have to start from scratch when you do an update, that you can save time by reevaluating. So you have, you'll have the infrastructure, the initial structure of everything you've looked at before, and you can reevaluate. Um, so you can go back to your easy tool and just update all of those vulnerability um, metrics, and you can, um, and then you can update your adaptation plan and really, but you can dust it off. So there are things that will stay most likely and you're adjusting. Um, and then the process would be, um, you know, looking for changes and reprioritizing. And maybe you have new people that are part of your planning team um, that want to be part of the prioritization process. Um, and that may change the flavor of, of what you focus on. And then um, I do want to mention this too. So once you've done this, Actually, as you're doing it, even at the implementation stage, even before you evaluated, um, you can begin to share your community story. Um, you know, if you've made it this far, your community is at the forefront forefront of climate adaptation, um, and not just in the tribal world, in all communities. Um, there's lots of communities that have yet to complete the adaptation planning process, and so um, we, as you can tell, we are borrowing from all sorts of communities that have made progress ahead of us. Uh, we recommend that you do the same. And then it's sort of like a giving back. So um, in this case, we're talking about both communicating your story internally to your own community and then externally so that others can benefit from it. And so um, we recommend communicating your activities and progress to your own community through, like we talked about, potentially progress reports. You can write those specifically internally and keep them um, just for your tribal council, or you can um, advertise those. You can distribute those to your uh, broader community so that they're aware of where you're at in the process. I've seen some cool ways of doing that. Um, in one case, this is the Macaw Tribes um, Climate Adaptation Dashboard here on the right. And it is an online dashboard showing progress sort of in real time. So as they're making progress, they update what the, um, how their strategies are going. So they are being very transparent about what they're accomplishing. And so, you know, they've come, they're sharing with our community that they've completed um, and they've completed enhancement and 
enhance promotion of agriculture best management practices to include future climate conditions. I think that's nice. I've done that in communities I've worked within, um, trying to share progress because I think it's good, especially for people that really care, <laughs> to see that things are happening and then it makes them feel like um, that you know we can really tackle this as a community. Um, the other way to do that is through community meetings. So if you do have, um, you can do a workshop. If you have a committee like Shasta does, you can be updating folks um, that way as well. You can also have a website like Shasta does where you're communicating that um, that way. It doesn't have to be in a dashboard necessarily. It could be just narratively. Um, and then in terms of externally, uh, you can um, document the process and results um, through a case study, academic or scientific journals, articles. Oftentimes we are asked to do this as part of a grant opportunity, um, but it's a it's helpful. And so there's all sorts of ways to share information. Um, you can share it directly with other tribes, maybe in your region. Um, EPA, of course, who helped fund this project, uh, would like to see um, those pieces of information as well. It all depends. I mean, this is a issue, of course, for traditional knowledge. I know that there are some communities that don't like to share um, their planning work or their progress reports or their you know what they're actually doing on the ground or at least not in a lot of detail but if you are um, you know we would certainly like to incorporate it into our resource clearinghouse so we can share it with other communities um, through the tribal climate health project um, there's also the u.s climate resilience toolkit there's the bia tribal resilience website and then itep as well i know tracks a lot of case studies um, and shares information as well so lots of different ways to share your story jess is there any others that you would suggest it's always great to take the opportunity to present at conferences uh, that have a tribal component and uh, just to put in a shameless plug i'm part of the steering committee for a new conference that itep is hosting in late august of 2020 and that's the uh what are we calling it the national tribal and indigenous climate conference so nticc and the website uh, the itep website has some information about that We'll be announcing soon the location. It's uh, probably going to be in the upper Midwest, so we'll give you those specifics soon. But we'll be looking for people to participate in that. So please uh, get that on your calendar. If you haven't already received the save the dates, let me know and I will send that out to you. But conferences are always great. And especially, I think, if you can go to a conference that's not necessarily tribally focused, to be able to present on the work that you're doing and just remind people that the tribes are out there doing this work, that it needs to be done, uh, and that tribes need to be considered as part of this work instead of having tribal lands, you know, reservations, uh, just being blank spots on the map. Uh, and we actually have a comment here from Mara, and she says, sharing with peers is always a plus and perhaps the most useful, meaningful, and sustainable. And yes, she's absolutely correct that as much as you can share with your peers. And that's why we have the Google group so that you can use that to communicate, start discussion threads, and we're going to keep that running. So feel free to take advantage of that. That's right. Okay. All right. So that's the material for today. Now, the only thing we have left to do is just sort of do kind of close ourselves out a little bit. There'll be a, a couple pieces of um, housekeeping here to handle. Um, but I want to say a very sincere thank you for participating. This was, of course, our first time doing this whole series as a webinar, and we appreciate um, your involvement. We ended up, I think, at the very end, we've had 114 people register. Um, and I've been really pleased, really pleased with the participation and involvement. Um, and we're, of course, looking to do it um, again and better the next time. So um, we'll talk a little bit about how you might be able to help us do that. Um, but before we do, if there's just a little bit of sort of closing discussion we can have, if folks are able to, raise your hand or write a comment in the question box. Um, I'm just wondering, how has this training enabled you to return home, when probably there now, and get to work? And any other closing thoughts or well wishes for members of uh, other participants of the group before we close our series? And a and reminder we, that, oh, 
Sorry, uh, reminder, I'll be sending out the uh, the email survey as well. So um, any remaining time we have in the hour, please use that to complete that survey so that it doesn't drop off your, your radar. And then uh, I want to give a, a last shout out with my uh, screaming goat to get your attention to put something into the chat box or, or raise your hand. So here she is. Oh. OK. <laughs> You guys are going to miss that note. Uh, we have a, a thank you, everyone, from Trisha Prank. You're welcome. Uh, and from Eileen Nunez, she says, thank you so much. All the presentations have been so helpful and so much information to take in and use. Thanks so much, Shasta and Angie. You're welcome, Eileen. Um, Caroline Chen says, this has been so informative. The easy tool is fantastic. Thank you. That's Caroline from LA County. So good. So glad that we can help out uh, with LA. Um, oh, and Michael Chekhov, thank you. He says he loves the goat. I love the goat too. I, I use it on my staff all the time. Like, get out of my office. Ah! <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Um, oh, last one, Le Levi Anderson. Thank you both. This has been a very valuable resource in climate change planning. Um, and actually with that, Angie's probably going to bring this up too, but we are having another webinar series that begins in January. And it's going to cover a lot of the same material, but the reason that we are hoping that some of you will participate again is that we're looking for people to participate as groups, as regional cohorts. So we're hoping that you can partner with, obviously, uh, yourself as, as a member of a tribal environmental staff, but find somebody in from another tribe nearby to partner with you, and then reach out to a local agency perhaps your local public health department or uh, somebody from an academic setting who is working on climate change adaptation and get into groups of two or three or four or even more within your region and work together because doing this as a group when we all have the same desires to you know, create these plans and implement them, it's always great to have a group uh, to work with. So please consider that. And if you are uncertain about whether you can form a group, you can still register. And there's a box on the registration that you can check that says, I'm interested in being matched with people from my region. So we will try to connect people. And you can register as an individual. So however you want to participate, it's never a bad thing to go through the information again. Um, and then we have a, another comment here from Christopher Paulino. He says, I just want to thank the staff for the wealth of knowledge presented. This training has definitely made the whole drafting process less intimidating, and I look forward to the next webinar series. Thank you, Christopher. So do we. Thank you. Yeah, so that is a good transition into talking about that next um, webinar series. So Shasta, I'm imagining after this, you'll follow up and send people the, um, the link to where they can register with, for more information. And then we would love if you can help us spread the word too. So say for example, you got your fill on this round, but you know somebody else who should um, who should be trained. Um, folks can of course participate in the, or they can watch the videos, but this one's gonna have a little bit of a different flavor. Um, this one, we are trying to make it so that it's actually, um, it's an eight, eight month series and we will meet once a month for an hour and a half. And the idea is we want to focus on actual implementation in between. So we want to focus on making our way through the steps over the course of the eight months as much as possible, um, especially by collaborating with um, others to get through the process of doing the work of you know, the vulnerability assessment and the adaptation plan. So that's the goal, a little bit more, um, let's actually do the work than talk about it. So uh, we would appreciate your help spreading the word and then so Shasta I don't know if you have it handy already the email but um, this is the link to the survey and we would super appreciate if you would before you shift gears to your next thing take some time to fill out the final assessment and evaluation this is your opportunity to tell us um, what we can do to improve upon what we've done here for the next session and what we do after this um, and so please share your ideas we uh, yeah. we're thick skinned <laughs> yeah, check Check your email because I just hit send on that on that email, so it should be arriving in your inbox. And uh, I also want to add, um, I see that we have one of our participants, Morgan Shaw, who's joining us from Alaska, sent me an email uh, pointing out that 
Alaska time is an hour earlier than Pacific time. And we had planned this for 9 a.m. thinking, okay, 8 a.m. Alaska can do 8 a.m. Well, it turns out that a lot of tribal offices in Alaska don't even open until 9 a.m. Alaska time. So our next webinar series, we had planned to do it at the same time from 9 to 1030. We're going to shift that to be an hour later. So that way, since there's so many of our tribal folks in Alaska, and I'm sure a lot of them are working on this stuff and, and would love to participate, we're going to make that an hour later so that way our Alaska colleagues can join us without having to be at, at the office at the crack of dawn um, or, you know, get up an hour early. <laughs> so thank you so much, Morgan, for, for pointing that out. I really appreciate that feedback. Um, oh, and and... She, she actually, I don't know if you're she or he, Morgan, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm getting that wrong, um, but says, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, Golna Chish. That, I, I'm going to assume that's thank you. <laughs> oh, and it's she. Thank you, Morgan. So Golna Chish, she says. Um, and then uh, from Lisa Montgomery, she says, thank you for a very informative webinar series. Although it was difficult to join in some days, I'm glad I made the commitment. I will definitely share with Region 7 tribes and invite them to join your new webinar series. Thank you so much. It, it, it warms my heart, uh, and I'm, I'm so glad that you all stuck with us through these uh, through these ten webinars. Thank you. So the last thing I want to talk about is just that this is not really the end. It's the end of our webinar series, but as an alum, we're asking that you continue to engage with our Tribal Climate Health ongoing peer learning community, as Shasta mentioned, and so. We were fortunate to get um, some BIA funding to help us continue things along a bit. And so that means that could mean things just as simple as a quarterly webinar where we come back together with all the alums of all the um, trainings that we've done, anybody who wants to continue learning and bring up various topics and speakers and things. Um, but we're in design of that right now. And so if you have ideas for what would be helpful for ongoing learning, then let us know. And of course, like Shasta said, the Google groups are going to continue. And so we, we, we will use those to continue to share an announcement, share news, something that's relevant to tribal climate health. Um, and we encourage you to use it as well to do some peer sharing. And let's see. And so that's it. We just wanna say thank you. That's Shasta's contact information and my contact information. You are definitely welcome to, to stay in touch or follow up with questions. And we just want to acknowledge our funding agencies, including the EPA, the BIA, um, and all the folks that helped us design this curriculum. There were a lot of people from the Tribal Climate Health Advisory Board, and as well as the National Indian Health Board for their funding contributions as well. And um, as usual, we'll send some resources out and we'll send this whole presentation out with the recording after, after we're done today. So again, thank you so much. Um, and please do stay in touch. I hope I get to meet many of you in person someday. And thank you and uh, happy holidays. Stay warm and uh, we'll be communicating with you again soon. All right. All right. Bye, everybody.